that. Help your word to penetrate into our heart and soul and mind so that we can know you more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. How many of you were here last night? Hey! Yeah, good. I don't know how many of our people showed up, but wasn't that great last oh, night? Oh, man, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Full house. That was good. What we'll get the next time? More. I hope the next place has more chairs. More you know? Yeah, I'm not sure how big they are. Yeah, I wonder. So. That would make the newspaper standing room only. Yeah, right? For this is <coughs> so exciting. Okay, <laughs> Ezra 8. What newspaper would that be? <laughs> yeah, what, what newspaper would that be? <clears throat> All right. Do you remember where we left off so we don't have to uh, back up? 15. <clears throat> kind of, sort of. But do you remember what happened there? <clears throat> kind of, sort of. Okay, chapter 8, verse 21. That to 23 is where uh, uh, Ezra proclaims a fast uh, at the river. They would deny themselves before their God to seek him for a safe journey for, for themselves, for the children, their possessions, because he was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers, right? A military escort, uh, because he had told the king, hey, our God loves us and he's going to protect us. But then Ezra was kind of thinking, uh, hmm. It is, then again, you know, what if he doesn't, uh, you know, think, we're, we're never guaranteed the safety, you know that. No, nowhere did God say, I will always protect you from any bad thing or any bad guy. I will always protect you from attacks or robberies. Or, no. Christians get attacked and Christians can, can be beat up. Uh, it happens. Christians are actually persecuted more than any other people group on the planet. Don't forget that. But I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he will never leave us in the midst of it. Isn't that right? Okay. So um, here we go. Uh, verse 24 is where we're going to pick up. And uh, I want somebody to please read through verse 34. Then I set apart 12 of the leading priests, namely Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their brothers. And I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisors, his officials, and all Israel present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold valued at a thousand derricks, and two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold. I said to them, you as well as these articles are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, before the leading priests and the Levites and the family heads of Israel. Then the priests and Levites received the silver and gold and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. On the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem, where we rested three days. On the fourth day, in the house of our God, we weighed out the silver and gold and the sacred articles into the hands of Merimoth, son of Uriah the priest. Eleazar, son of Phinehas, was with him, and so were the Levites, Josabad, son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, son of Benui. Everything was accounted for by number and weight, and the entire weight was recorded at that time. Okay. Uh, you know what? Read 35 and 36 as well. Then the exiles who had returned from captivity sacrificed burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 male lambs, and, as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's orders to the royal satraps and to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, who then gave assistance to the people and to the house of God. Okay. So Ezra, and thank you very much, this is a long read, uh, charged these key leaders, these key men, with the responsibility of getting the precious metals and all the valuables back to Jerusalem safely. Uh, and in his charge, he said that these material possessions were consecrated to the Lord or holy to the Lord, and that the silver and gold were freely given by God's people. Okay? Uh, he emphasized the need for guarding the money and the articles carefully by noting that they would all be weighed on arrival to make sure nothing disappeared. Nobody pocketed anything on the way. <coughs> the treasures in silver and gold, including 25, included 25 tons of silver in today's 
measurements, 25 tons wow. of silver. Heavy. Silver, silver articles weighing three and three quarter tons. Three and three quarter tons of gold. 20 bowls of gold that weighed 19 pounds each. Two expensive bronze objects. And all of this would be you know, valued at many millions of dollars today. Uh, no wonder Ezra was concerned about the people's safety. You know, getting robbed on the way. Really? Right? Uh, the priests of Levites, they accept their responsibility of taking the metals and the utensils back to Jerusalem. Uh, and how would you like to accept responsibility for receiving, counting, and depositing other people's money? No. <laughs> Told me. <You're> <laughs> Craig does it all the time. <laughs> Can I have mine back? Now, if, if, if that was your job, uh, do you think some people might wonder if you would be trustworthy and honest? How, how many people wonder about this in this church? Has it ever crossed your mind? No. Hmm, I wonder if the people who are, you know, the leadership who are taking care of the money, I wonder if they're trustworthy. <laughs> you ever think about that? <laughs> if you are in a former church, did you ever wonder about that? Yes. Okay. We see what you drive. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'm going to go get me a, even a rustier rust bucket. <laughs> So uh, the temple revenues that were included, they were for what we'd call the general budget. Okay? They purchased all the public sacrifices. That's you know, uh, the things that are offered in the name of the whole congregation of Israel. So there's specific animals to be offered on everybody's behalf. So the money goes there, uh, such as the morning and the evening sacrifices. The temple treasury defrayed all else necessary for the services of the sanctuary, all temple repairs, the salaries of, the, of a large staff, really, of regular officials uh, that paid for the repairs of the city walls, the roads, the public buildings of Jerusalem. Now, ministry costs. It's a reality. It did then, it does now. Uh, good ministry costs. You know, and, uh, and it's always cost the people of God. So if anybody, you know, I, I know, uh, I hear it all the time. People will not come to church. They don't go to church. Oh, because church is all they do is talk about money. No, we don't. Don't. Maybe some do, but we don't. Uh, my, my MO has always been, Amy Wagner shares it with me, we, we, we talked about this years ago. She didn't, money's not a thing, I don't care. Um, I don't care to know who gives what. I actually don't, I don't know if you know this, I have no idea what anybody gives. None. Did you know that? I have no idea. Okay, I, and I, that's always been my policy on purpose because I don't want to, uh, in case I'd have bias, let's say you gave a lot, I don't want to treat you better than somebody that doesn't give as much. Uh, let's say you don't give anything, you can't give anything. I'm not gonna, I don't want to treat you less. I don't think I would anyway. But, you know, I, just, I don't care to know. Um, uh, I don't care to uh, be in charge of the money. I'm not in charge of the money. Money does not pass through my hands. Uh, uh, the, the elders, you know, well, we'll talk a little more about it in a moment, but we got people that, over, that do that. And they do an incredible job at it. Talk about that again in, in a moment. And I have nothing to do with money. No. For a completely opposite, a different reason. You she likes the shot. I don't, like, I don't care about it, but it's, I'm really bad with it, too. <laughs> yeah, so there. So, <laughs> that is. So, uh, <laughs> So, I, I guess. Yeah. So, I, I guess I want to tell you when, when, when you hear Christians say, you know, they get all worried about oh, well, how they're now we're going to build a building that's going to cost so much money. Well, yeah, I'm not up for um, unnecessarily uh, unnecessary buildings. Uh, I mentioned last night for those who are here, uh, pastors are so often uh, caught up in I'd call it empire building. Yeah. They they kind of want their their own empire and. And they feel like they can't, you know, uh, go on to the next bigger church unless they somehow built a building and they led their people in some big old building campaign. And it's amazing how often once a building is built, pastors, they go to the next church. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? Wow. It's amazing how often that happens. It, it's almost a launch pad. Okay. Um, so this, this is five years old now, at least. Hey, you're not going nowhere. So. Um, we got a tower. Yeah, we do. We've got a cool radio tower out there, 125 feet. It's very cool. It's going to be really neat in the days ahead. So churches did not come up with the concept of tithes and offerings. Remember, that's Old Testament stuff. God came up with that. God demands that. He commands it. You know, like all of his commands, we usually think it's optional. But it's a part of his system, uh, the general budget for ministry. It really is. 
And Ezra, he, he tells these priests to guard the stuff with their lives. Why? Because the gifts, Ezra said, are holy. Catch this. We're told right here that the offerings of God's people and the savings accounts of, of the church are important to God. So important, they are called holy. And God described as holy, um, you know, anything belonging to God, because whatever belongs to God becomes holy. You and your gifts. Um, and so it also said, Ezra said, and you are holy. The guys who were handling the money. So his financial administrators are holy. Or, and they're to be holy. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so uh, let, me, let me talk about this for a moment. The oversight of all funds uh, used to be the responsibility of the priests, but in most churches today, it's given to a financial administrator or a board of directors or maybe the board of elders like ours. And it is still a holy responsibility because it's God's money and it needs to be done by, let's say, holy people who can be trusted, who've got a track record themselves of being good, ethical, yeah. Character. Yeah, you, you got to be good with your money. Okay. Um, no frivolous spending, no, no abuse. Um, you know, because no system is beyond abuse, right? I mean, responsible stewardship really demands that church finances be handled with absolute integrity. And churches, uh, let's say internal control systems, uh, ensure financial integrity. And um, you always got to choose people of integrity who've demonstrated a godly standard in areas of money and possessions in their own life. Um, and let's say the, the more stable the financial lives of church leaders, the more likely it is that they're going to maintain integrity in handling church finances. And they're not going to take a church and bring it into the red and it stays in the red and they can never get out of the red. A lot of churches, every Sunday, whoa, we're still in debt. You know, uh, need everybody to give more money. You know what? We're not. I don't think we ever were. We never were. I mean, in, in, I mean are we in debt? We have a mortgage? Yeah. But we've been in the black. Uh, I tell you, I want to brag on, um, on Craig, on Brian Filer, not here tonight, on Tony, and now Bruce, uh, Bruce Engel. He's not here tonight. They're all watching the Rush game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the video, right? Be yeah, yeah. <laughs> they used church funds to buy their tickets. No, they didn't. But um, they've uh, done an incredible job. Um, uh, they all are, are deal with money, counting, receiving, uh, tallying it up, bringing, preparing uh, financial reports for our monthly board meetings. Uh, they do a stellar job. Uh, and I, I couldn't be more proud of them, and, I, and I, I trust them implicitly, and I know you do too. And isn't that great? We've got some good people uh, who watch over it. So, Craig. Recognize our Sunday morning counters every Sunday morning faithfully. Julie and somebody. Goes Thank you, Julie. Counts it, it gets written down. You think about that. Yeah, every Sunday. Who, 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 who helps with that? Julie? And the elders and anybody else that I've asked because Randy is mm -hmm. here. God bless you. And that's a process. Every Sunday they go in there and they go through all that and count it. Thank you very much. It's deposited on Monday uh, and things are credited to, you know, everybody, whoever gave got that. Thanks so that Tony at the end of the year can give you what you just did, your end of year financial giving statement. So uh, thank you very much. Don't forget, all gifts are tax deductible. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I want to go a little bit more on that. You know, um, it, it's problems in, in one's own personal finances, among other factors, that lead people to embezzle funds. Some of you, you you've, you've had your own business, and maybe you've had somebody that has embezzled something. <clears throat> That, that's a rough thing. Um, this is why scripture is full of warnings to ensure the financial integrity of, of church leaders, insisting in 1 Timothy, when Paul says, you know, those who are leaders should not be lovers of money. 
and that they have a good reputation with outsiders. I mean, churches, a lot of churches, they go down because of financial mismanagement, or mishandling, stealing, uh, poor accounting, you know, with the IRS, and they get in trouble. Uh, by the way, twice, as you know, Jesus kicked people out of church, the temple, uh, and who were they? Money changers. Yeah, they were the people in charge of the money. They were all about money, the money changers. Uh, they were gouging people on the exchange rate. So they were, the, you'd come from the town you were from, and there was an exchange rate. And they'd say, you cannot give that money as an offering to God. You must use temple money, because it's holy, but we'll <laughs> trade you. And it was pretty much, you know, oh my gosh, we, do we know the rate? No, but we, we do know that they were gouging them. So temple money costs a lot more, uh, you know, I don't know, difference between the U.S. dollar and the Mexico peso, right? So um, uh, my, my dad, I want to say, my, my dad had an, a financial administrator. I think I've talked about this before. A financial administrator, and I was going to the church, I remember I was in high school at the time. Uh, this administrator personally didn't like the newest member of the pastoral staff. It was, it was a, my dad brought in an associate pastor, like Walter, okay, who just goes, we need this person on board. We need this person for where we're going. And so this administrator hid numbers in the books so that it appeared that there wasn't enough money to keep everybody on staff. And so the church would have to let somebody go and it would have to be the newest member who was just hired. Wow. Could you imagine that happening? When that came out, oh boy, <laughs> my dad was, you know, breathing smoke. Okay. Um, and we almost lost, we almost lost that, lost that pastor. Wow. Incredible. Remember, Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, he said, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? So, I mean, here's a question for us. How is our own financial situation? That might be a good question to ask ourselves right now. How is our personal financial situation. You need help? Hey, there's people who can help. Uh, Brian and Don Filer, they, they teach classes every once in a while regularly, I think, for Love, Inc., to help people, you know, get out of debt. Now would be a good time to get out of debt. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Under the comment that I, I just thought, thought of, Zig Ziglar was a, uh. was a fantastic motivator. And I remember him saying one time, Zig they were playing golf with a prospective person that they were going to hire, with the man who was going to hire him and Zig. And Zig saw that guy cheating on his golf score. <laughs> wow. And when he sat down to talk to the boss, he said, if the man's going to cheat on his golf score, how could we trust him with anything in this business? Yeah. That's funny. That's very true. That's very good. That's why, That's why Bill doesn't play off. Chapter 9. All right, somebody please read the first four verses. When these things had been done, the Jewish leaders came to me and said, Many of the people of Israel, and even some of the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the other people living in the land. They've taken up the detestable practices of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For the men of Israel have married women from these people and have taken them as wives for their sons. So the holy races become polluted by these mixed marriages. Worse yet, the leaders and officials have led the way in an outrage. When I heard this, I tore my coat and my shirt, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down, utterly shocked. Then all who trembled at the words of God of Israel came and sat with me because of this outrage committed by the returned exile. And I sat there, utterly appalled, until the time of the evening sacrifice. Ah! So, after these things have been done, okay, the, the, the delivery of the money, remember what's happening right here. Um, this is 60 years after the first group returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. Ezra led the way. Ezra went back to go get a second group. He leads a second group. Do you remember they were missing Levites? 
in the second group. So he had to go find some. Hey, we need some Levites. You know, we can't bring the money. We can't conduct certain religious things without those guys. So they get about 250 of them. They find them. They come back. They bring the money. He gets back. And no sooner does Ezra and this second group return to Jerusalem than some of the leaders came to Ezra with bad news. Which was, the people were doing the very thing that sent them into exile in the first place. And, and we're not told if these leaders were part of Ezra's group, this, this new returning one, or part of the first group that arrived six years earlier. If they were part of the first group, then they saw Ezra as the person who might be able to do something about it, because whatever faithful few remained, they were outnumbered, and they had no influence on the masses, clearly. So one of God's major prohibitions was that his people were not to marry outside of the community of believers. That's Exodus chapter 34. It's also Deuteronomy chapter 7. Exodus 34, Deuteronomy chapter 7. And it's not because of racial difference, skin color, not at all, okay? The people of the surround, per person, <clears throat> I have an interesting thought. I believe God thinks that's a fine thing. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think people who um, marry somebody with different skin color, their kids are, wow, they're really beautiful kids. They're gorgeous, they're gorgeous kids. Uh, case in point, my own daughter and her husband. My grandkids, they're beautiful. They're better looking than your grandkids. <laughs> my grandkids. Are. So, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, God has wired us, our DNA, our genes in such a way. I mean, th think of any species of any. Remember, humans are, we're all one. So when we say different race, we're all the same race. We're the human race. Okay, we just got different skin color. God never said, don't, you know, don't mix. No, I mean, anywhere else on earth, things will, will mix. Doesn't matter what color the dog is or the cat is, and when they mix, you get this incredible variety. It's something that's allowed. It's, I think it's kind of, I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. If you disagree, you got problems. <laughs> You're racist. There are exceptions though. You know, calico cats are sterile. You know, horses and, and Mules, whatever, or donkeys. Yeah, because they're different. Are sterile, you know, so they, they can't continue that lineage. Yeah, they're different. It's not like a Palomino and a Pinto yeah. are mating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're different. So, but here's the thing. Uh, the people of the surrounding areas, okay, all the ones you just heard, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Ammonites, they're all Semitic. Okay, or the vast majority, I should say. They're all Semitic. Um... They call it the same race. The reason for the prohibition was strictly religious. They don't worship me. They worship these other gods. And here's a problem. The Jewish men always had this thing for foreign women. That's kind of how it was. And uh, I guess the women did too. They had this thing for just, they're just a little different. You know, it's their, how they dress, what they do, what they, just their culture, and even, I guess, what they believe. And how in the world do you just come out of 70 years in captivity and 60 years into freedom, you're right back at doing what sent you into captivity? Yeah. New generation. Golly! Okay, so it's this self destructive behavior. And, and it's very clear that the report to Ezra was, I don't know how Ezra, first off, didn't see it. But um, sometimes something kind of starts going on and creeping and creeping and growing and then all of a sudden it's visible. And then by the time it's visible, it's a lot bigger than you thought it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about some stuff going on in our, in our country, and all of a sudden what popped up, and all of a sudden it's being accepted. Well, how'd that happen? It had been creeping and being taught. It was kind of under, under the radar, and then it, once a little more brave and courage, out of the closet, and everybody now knows, and oh my gosh, it had already been growing to a certain place. So Ezra's response uh, was typical of the response of godly people in the Old Testament when they found out about sin somewhere. Uh, it's this tearing of his tunic and his cloak. Uh, that was a sign of mourning. When he says he tore his tunic, okay, he's ripping his clothes, like ripping his buttons, right? Uh, he's pulling hair from his, his hair, uh, out of his head and out of his beard. Okay, that was a sign of unusual grief or even intense anger. And he said he was appalled 
because of the people's sin. Ezra was ashamed, he said, he was disappointed uh, and having a bad hair day. <laughs> and he knew there was a very good possibility that they would go into captivity again. I would be thinking that. Oh my gosh! Right? We're going back. It is very, very possible. Um, I hope you know this by, by heart already. James Madison, fourth president of the United States, known as the father of a constitution, he made this famous statement. We have staked the whole, how much is whole? Oh. Uh -huh. Of all, how much is all? Oh. We have staked the whole of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Now, there's been Sunday mornings I have come in here. I, 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 I know I've appeared very upset. It's a condition of our nation, our, our nation that's been unable and unwilling to govern ourselves and control ourselves to the Ten Commandments of God. And some of you are like that, too, and you come in, it's very heavy on you. Yeah. It's been heavy on me for a long time. For a lot of years, it's been heavy on me. It's just part of my thing. It's, uh, I'm supposed to see it and... Try to do something about it with, with all of you. Um, the problem with that Constitution is that it's only good for a moral and righteous person. Mm -hmm. right. And that's what it is, right? Amen. That's the thing. It's only good mm -hmm. if, if we can, can control, govern ourselves according to God's commands. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's all going to fall apart. Because all the things that you need to do, you know, to be honest and not lie, not bear false testimony, not steal, and everything else... I mean, read the Constitution. It's a very moral document. It is moral. And, uh, you know, I haven't started pulling out my hair yet, but I just might grow a beard in anticipation for the day. <laughs> grow my beard. Pull a beard out. I don't know. Philip. How long was it after the parting of the Red Sea and such did they, the Israelites build the, the golden calf? Minutes. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> so it seems. So it is two weeks after they leave Egypt right. that they are at the front door of the promised land. And uh, they don't go in. Um, and it is at that time uh, the, the enemy's been drowned already. Okay. Moses is up in the mountain talking uh -huh. to God. And, yep. And uh, it, is, it is that soon. Uh, it, it is, it is, it's happening it keeps right there. And, yeah. I mean, learners, huh? Yeah. Now, <laughs> now the, the only, you can't cut them slack, uh, but you got to remember uh, 400 years in Egypt as slaves in a land that does nothing but worship Egyptian gods and put a kibosh on your let's say, public expression of worshiping your God, they were so used to the Egyptian infection uh, that when Aaron thought, hey, let's build, you know, give me all your gold, let's melt it, and we'll form a golden calf, and we'll worship it. Well, the, 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 the calf, the cow, the bull, uh, there is a god, one of the Egyptian gods, the head of a bull, body of a man, um, and they would, like in India, they would also, they would see it as a, as a holy animal. Um, in India today, the rat is higher than the human. The, the, the cow is higher than the human, which is why India is starving, by the way. Um, they have steak walking the streets, but they don't eat it because of Brahma, uh, who is this bull god. And, um, and so the, the cow is, is holy and the cows are allowed to graze and they roam and they, they defecate over all the fields of human food as they get to eat freely because it is higher life form. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a spiritual animal. So it's allowed to graze and eat whatever. Uh, you go into an Indian house um, and there are rats that are allowed freely to, to roam and, and eat. Let's say you had a box of cereal and you looked in and there's a rat 
halfway through your cereal, it's defecated over all of your cereal. You don't touch it because it is a spiritual animal. The, way, the reason why India is, is starving is because of a spiritual problem. Wow. They worship false gods. They still worship at the idols of the Ammonites, the, the, God, the Egyptians, same kind of thing. And this is, that's what you get. Wow. Okay? Um, this goes to show how difficult it is to get to fight off sin. Like you were saying, they were so in, ingrained with worshiping Egyptian gods and stuff that uh, this, they are so used to it. So same thing with, with sin in a sense. It's like yeah. We're so used to sinning that it's, yes. it's become second nature. Yes. Yeah, like, yes. Well, yes. What is sin? I don't know. Yeah, okay, yes. All right, that good. Exactly. So, I mean, that's why, in case you're curious, why, did, why the golden calf? Usually we never question that. They, may, they make this golden calf because that was a god in Egypt. They took that god with them. Aaron, he was also there. He was a slave there. First thing that came to his mind, oh my gosh. Okay? And imagine, and God still kept him as the high priest of the nation. Oh! Long suffering. Amazing. So, you know, God is merciful and gracious. Stuart. Are you mm -hmm. Jewish because you're born Jewish? Or are you Jewish because you follow the religion? Either. Yeah, people, people. Yeah, you could be um, spiritually Jewish. You're, you're, you know, you're either Jewish by blood, by an actual, literal, if you can even trace it, a connection or re relationship to Abraham and Sarah. It, you know, one of the twelve tribes. Somehow you can trace your lineage. Um, otherwise, you can be culturally Jewish, spiritually Jewish. Uh, and there are people who, uh, you know, even in our, in our scriptures, who entered into Judaism, which we're, we're going to, I don't think we'll be able to finish it tonight, but I'll just say in the 10th chapter, they're, the men are having to kick out the foreign wives they married, who uh, some of them were cultural, they became Jews. Mm. It's very interesting. Um, so you, you can be Jewish by choice. Got another question. So if you're born Jewish, but you're not practicing the religion, your children, well, are your right. children Jewish? Supposedly. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. so there's, <laughs> there's something called covenant theology. That's what theologians call it. Covenant theology goes like this. In the Old Testament, you're Jewish because you're related by blood, so you are caught up uh, automatically in the blessings and the, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham. So uh, this covenant theology, if you are connected physically by blood to Abraham, you are a part of the covenant. If you're a practicing Jew or not, you're still Jewish. You got Hebrew blood in you. Mm -hmm. Now, it took them a while, even in the New Testament, to understand that God says, eh, it's not the blood thing, you, you misunderstand. It's the blood thing for you Jewish connected to, connected to Abraham and your obedience of my commands, right? Um, and then the whole sacrificial system, and then in the New Testament, um, and even as today, I'm Jewish, spiritually. So are you. By adoption. Yeah. So, uh, and don't forget, um, nowhere did Jesus call anybody Christians. He never said, you are now, all of you who follow me, you're now Christians. Ta-da! That's now your name. No. The, the New Testament is full of Jews that followed him, who simply recognized him as the Jewish Messiah, who ultimately was given by God to the world to open salvation to the world, that the world could take part of the blessings that God first promised Abraham and Sarah, to be a part of the promised land to last forever and ever, right? Mm -hmm. To have that eternal seed, to have that, all the things that come with, with that, the covenant. Uh, so, you know, um, we call ourselves Christians because in the book of Acts, at one point, they're in a town where the name is given. And, and it says that for the first time, you know, they were called or referred to as Christians. Can be translated as um, little Jesuses, little Christs, or uh, just like an American is from America, a Christian is from Jesus. Jesus was the Christ, so if we're followers of Christ, the we're Christians. Christians. But spiritually, 
We're Jewish. We? Though we've all been saying for centuries, we're a Christian. Yeah. I am a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian, but I'm part of a Jewish faith. It's, you know, we're grafted. It's the whole Romans argument, right? Yeah. Does that mean we have to start eating kosher food? <laughs> no. All you want. But don't you remember what happened with the Philip. towel that came down? <laughs> yes. So, no, you don't have to eat <laughs> kosher food. So, no and didn't we talk about that? We talked about this last Sunday, didn't we? Yeah, you know, there's certain things you just don't, you know, that's what Paul was talking about. Uh, you just, there's certain things that you have to do anymore. We'll even talk about this Sunday, next Sunday as we go into idols. Modern day Jews boast of, of having the blood of David. You know, they, they don't talk about the blood of Abraham. So imagine if instead of boasting on blood of David if they boasted on the blood of Christ instead. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't, did I answer that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you could be related to Abraham by blood, but, but you're, not, you're not obedient. And even if you're related, you're not getting in. You've got to be related to the Jewish Messiah, who is only Jesus. So, right? Okay. So, um, if you want to eat a queen, then you can. Sure, because that, that's where I'm going to say, yeah, but I'm a Gentile. So, I can eat bacon burgers with pork, pulled pork. Yeah. So, um, yes. <laughs> chicharrones. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, all right. So Ezra, Ezra expected to see something else when he arrived in Jerusalem, didn't he? I mean, imagine you're him. Expect, expecting he's. I'm coming. I'm. I'm going to Godly Land. You know. Uh, I'm going to ride the rides. I'm going to get a frozen banana. You know. I'm going to Godly Land. Um, and it turns out to be, you know, anything but. Uh, and what a letdown. And, you know, you learned about uh, Ezra in chapter 7. It says he was a priest, he was a scribe, he was a scholar of the text of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. And then it says, for Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, verse 10, and to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. And so Ezra, he had all these dreams of how it was going to be. He comes in that, with that first group. They're going to rebuild that temple. Remember that? He's got all these dreams. I'm, if I was him, I'd be having these dreams about, you know, teaching huge Bible studies. Everybody would come to Bible study on Wednesday night. Because everybody's thirsty for the Word of God. But, you know. Hmm. Um, worship services. Standing room only. I'm not, if I'm him thinking, all these people are finally getting out of Babylon, we're going back home. Oh, everybody's going to come to church every night if we had something every night. Right. Revival, right? That's what a revival looks like. You're, everybody, you're always there. It just, it's just this ongoing awesome thing. Uh, you know, uh, starting the Jerusalem Bible College. I don't know. I just wonder, what's, what's in his mind? You know, um, and I don't think... He expected that all of his knowledge of the law and his close obedient walk with God was actually to bring conviction and knowledge to a wayward and forgetful nation. He wasn't there to um, conduct a revival and, and to watch one take place. Oh my gosh, my job is to keep people from sliding south again. He didn't realize it at the time, you know, but let's say he was right on schedule, right where God needed him to be, with his devotion to accurate teaching of the scriptures, to help a nation regain its conscience, and this covenant community with God once again. Now, why did the spiritual leaders of the first, first group stop all of this from happening? I mean, was it lack of vigilance? Did they become weary of continually holding up God's laws and requiring people to live by them? I mean, think about the life of a police officer. <sighs> so much of what you're doing, your job is dealing with people who are breaking the laws. Even worse, a correctional officer. Oh, 
right? Repeat offenders. Oh. Over and over. Oh. I mean, that's good. that could get old. You've got to be a very special individual to, to devote your life to that, right? So um, was it because they allowed their personal resolve to wear down? They gave in themselves, which we heard some of the leaders, maybe a lot of the leaders, actually led the charge. And they were taking these, some foreign women as their own wives. Oh my gosh. And that greased the slide for the rest of the people. There's a spiritual law that's found throughout the history of Israel and throughout church history. Now that's it. When people go down spiritually, it's because certain spiritual leaders led the way. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Oh, do I go into this? Mm. Go ahead. Mm. Mm. I'll say uh, at, at a promise, key, uh, a uh, Watchman on the Wall event uh, in D.C., one of the natu natural, national pastor's briefings, gosh, this was years ago, I was back in Hawaii. Um, and by the way, Walter and Craig just came back from D.C., and they're going to share this Sunday, give a little report from what happened. It's awesome, okay? Um, and uh, Larry, Pastor Larry Stocksdale of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, he was uh, one of the speakers at this event. He was the, the, the pastor of Bethany World Prayer Center. If, if Bethany Prayer, World Prayer Center ever sounds familiar, um, uh, that's the, the guy, I was so um, touched by what he said. And when he spoke, it's one of those things, I, I'm, I'm hearing God, I mean, God is talking through this guy. And he said that God had spoke to him um, while he was flying over Kansas, uh, not, not much earlier to this event we were at. And he said, the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to shake this nation. He said that was just as clear as the Lord called him into ministry at 16 years of age. And the Spirit said that America doesn't need another revival, but a revolution. Wow. of the power of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and said I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to shake your family then I'm going to shake your church then your city then the nation wow. he said uh, he was on his treadmill a week later he got a call from a friend in Denver who serves um, with him as a co-overseer of I'll just mention a, it's a huge church at the time in Denver uh, anywhere between six and 10,000 members. Wow. Um, and I'll just say, um, he got a call that the pastor of that church um, was in trouble um, and solicited another man in a bathroom in a park, a public park. <coughs> and the guy said, every major news outlet has somebody here outside of uh, the church. And he immediately flew over there. And, um, and he said he just began to see the seriousness God has. Um, when he says we need to conduct ourselves in such a way, leadership needs to conduct their, themselves. Um, if, if we don't, what begins to shake, and then the, the bad reputation, and then the unbeliever who themselves struggle with, let's say, same-sex attraction or whatever, hears about a famous pastor who does, they go, well, if they do, and it greases the slide. Right? Right? Now, I don't know what you think. Just put this in your, your, uh, your thinker. Um, it wasn't long ago that a whole bunch of Roman Catholic priests were in the news for molesting the choir boys, you know, uh, the, uh, the altar boys and all that. Now the Pope honors gay marriage. Yeah, and the Pope now honors gay marriage. And um, at first you hear it, it's, an, it's, it's terrible, it's appalling, as Ezra would say, to the faithful community. But to those who struggle with that, they go, I can understand why. They have like, um, they've got a different way of looking at it. 
and it greases the slide for the person that struggles with it. The pedophile. Pedophilia is out in the open. Trying to get, you know, on the books, you know, uh, the intergenerational love uh, law so that, you know, the, being a pedophile isn't uh, against the law anymore. You know how this goes. So um, let me jump to this. Yeah, right. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop. We're almost at eight. Um, <clears throat> I want you to consider Samson. Again, he had enormous potential. He's born in Nazarite. He lived under godly parents. Uh, but little deceptions entered into his life. You know, as a Nazarite, he took that vow not to drink any alcohol, uh, not to d touch anything dead, and never to cut his hair. Uh, but he's in a vineyard in Timna when he's not supposed to touch grapes. He's touching the carcass of a dead lion when he's not supposed to touch a dead body, nothing dead. He's got all these little compromises in his life. And then you know the story of Samson. Uh, have you seen, uh, did it, do you remember Planet Earth? The, the BBC um, had this special called Planet Earth. It was out for a while. Uh, I thought it was pretty amazing how in the world they were able to catch on film what they did. Just, just, just spectacular. In one segment, I remember, they were showing this cave in Indonesia where thousands of glowworms were hanging from the ceiling, and that's pitch black in the cave. And under each glow worm was this strand of silk, mm -hmm. and really long. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just hanging there, and moths would come up from the bottom of the cave, drawn by the light, um, and uh, you know, the, a moth's wing would touch that silk, and they didn't know it, but they were as good as dead because uh, they'd never get free from that silk. And they'd, they'd flap, they'd move their wings, and gradually that glow worm pulled them off one inch at a time towards its mouth. And then you'd hear that worm eat that moth. Crunch, 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 crunch. Wow. And the ceiling of the cave is crunch, 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 crunch. <laughs> okay. Um, so Ezra, he watched what was happening like we are watching what is happening. And we're flirting with disaster. Mm -hmm. The moths, they did not. You know? Um, so what happened to the pastor uh, I was referring to in Denver? There's, uh, I think I mentioned last night, at least 400,000 churches in America. Uh, let's say 10% of them are living in sin. How many, you want to guess, how many, how many pastors you think today are living in willful sin? Some sort of a secret thing. At least that many. Probably yeah. more than that. At least 10%. Probably more like what, what, what's 10% of 400,000? 40,000. 40, what if it's 20,000 pastors? It's still a Who's going to reach them? The Holy Spirit. Right. <laughs> wow. Hopefully a loving congregation. Right. Right. Hey, I'll tell you, Larry Stockdale at that year uh, in D.C., he said that we as pastors are to blame for the demise of our nation. And if we don't get our lives right before Almighty God, we are going to lose the nation. And the only way to stop it is going to be the pastors of the nation doing what Ezra does, and what we're going to see him do next, next week, in chapter 10. And we're just talking, no compromise, cutthroat, you got to make some changes. Okay? Next week. I see it. Thank you. I do see it. is being installed. Good. That, that house is double wall. There's an outside big wall with reservoir, and then you've got this area, and then it's wall around the house, too. It is amazing. Uh, that is going to be the safest house in Uganda. Yeah, cool. right. What about the pump? Is that the yet? Uh, I, not that I know of. The pump? 
They, they didn't. I, I think they're doing the security they're first. Re secure them. Yeah, and then they're gonna re, re yeah re drill a well on the inside. Sorry. For some reason, the well was drilled first. First thing to happen, and then they built the home, and then they built the wall. But the well turned out to be outside of the wall. Oh no! And so the well. I don't. I don't think we mentioned this, but uh, Shamim let us know a couple of weeks ago. Uh, her property was vandalized. Um, not the house, but um, the, the actual the pump of the well was was stolen, and it's outside of the perimeter wall. And then uh, there's lights that have been taken, some security lights and all, and um, uh, crimes often there are violence, and so she's not sleeping at night. And so we said um, on the recommendation of the local police do all those things to, to safeguard the house. So they're putting up an electric fence, maybe it's all the way up, razor wire, all the way around the top. Um, they'll put in a camera um, and they'll want a couple dogs. And I just, you know, and so Bill had some ideas on what kind of dogs, you know, that are good with kids. Hungry. And good with bad guys. <laughs> and so I forwarded that information to Shamim, said here's, here's some breeds suggested uh, by Bill and um, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll see what happens. So it's good. Okay, we're done. Uh, thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll pray and, and we'll go. Okay, Tom, would you pray us out tonight? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather again and for giving us the freedom to do that. Huh. Thank you for Pastor Scott bringing us your word and walking us through it and explaining it and allowing us to ask questions and to understand. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit that was here last night and the yeah. people that were here. And just the, um, the reminder of how powerful you are. Help us to take you with us as we go through the rest of the week and keep us safe as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.